Capitol Report is a production of Senate Media Services. Ten newly elected senators will take the oath of office in the next legislative session. This week, we continue our series of introductions with senators-elect from St. Cloud and St. Paul, plus a new first for the election of the Senate president. Stay tuned for this and more on this week's Capitol Report. Welcome to this week's program. I'm Shannon Lurkey. Erin Murphy is no stranger to the state capitol. She served in the House of Representatives for 12 years, including two of those years as House Majority Leader. She also ran for governor in 2018 as the DFL-endorsed candidate, but lost to Tim Walls in the primary. She easily won the race to represent District 64 in St. Paul following the retirement of Senator Dick Cohen. I spoke with her this week and began by asking her why she wants to serve in the Minnesota Senate. Well, Shannon, thanks a lot for having me today. And I'm, I'm really, really happy to join you and to be able to talk with Minnesotans. Over the 12 years that I served in the House, I learned a few things. Uh, one, I care deeply about the people of Minnesota and especially in the race for governor where I spent a lot of time with people all over the state. I learned that people actually care about each other, about our communities, and that when we lead with a hopeful vision and we put more faith in what we can do together, we actually get more done. Uh, we face some real urgent issues in Minnesota. We face urgent issues in this country. And I believe I have um, both the ambition and the, and the ability to work with the people of Minnesota to advance solutions uh, to meet the problems that people are facing. That's why I ran for the Senate and I'm so excited to be elected and to be going back to the work for the people of Minnesota. Now, some of those issues, let's dig into that a little bit because I imagine that in your run for governor, you really had to become familiar not with just district issues, but issues that face the state as a whole. So from that perspective, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges facing the legislature in the next session? So I, uh, I learned a lot from the people of Minnesota and we are a big tall state. And when I think about the regions of the state, I think about a beautiful mosaic. And Minnesotans have specific needs depending on where they live. Uh, but the thing that unites us is the things that we all need together. We need good schools for our kids. We need clean water and clean air. We need a healthcare system that we can count on, a good job. Um, and we need a political system and a democracy that functions and serves the people of Minnesota. Uh, I know in the next two years, we're gonna be working very hard for the people of Minnesota and doing the things that the legislature does in terms of balancing a budget, et cetera. Um, but I'm gonna be in hot pursuit of the solutions to the hardest issues that we face. Um, right now, I'm thinking a lot about um, COVID and the pandemic and what it's done to communities, uh, to our livelihoods to the health of the people, we need to work on that. But I'm also looking ahead to solutions on climate change, um, to make sure that we are actually dealing with racial disparities and building a future that is equitable and inclusive for everybody in the state of Minnesota. And to bring Minnesotans voices to bear on the work that we're doing because the power really in our democracy rests with them. And if you listen closely to the people of Minnesota, they are clear all over the state that they want progress and they're tired of a kind of politics that centers too much on the power inside the Capitol and not nearly enough on their lives. Uh, that's where I'm gonna do my work with the people of Minnesota. Now, you worked as a nurse for many years and then you worked for the Nurses Union. Now you teach uh, some nursing courses or at least one at St. Kate's. What's your perspective on how Minnesota is doing with COVID-19, how the nurses are handling this crisis, and does this crisis in any way change the future of nursing? So I think if we listen to nurses, uh, to doctors, to home care workers, to the people who work in our nursing homes, they are telling a very, very urgent and important story. They are warning us of the danger that we're facing. And I think some of that warning is getting lost in the translation of a political battle over COVID. So I have been tuning my ear and asking Minnesotans to pay attention to what the nurses and doctors and healthcare providers across the state are saying to us, that COVID is serious, that it is a virus that can kill people, and that we have to take measures together 
both as individuals and systemic measures that can slow down the surge. Nurses have been, since the start of this, uh, caring for people intensely in our hospitals and in our clinics. Uh, I know nursing professors are working with students who aren't getting the same clinical experience, and yet they need to come ready to take their exams and care for people. So it's changing the landscape for us in a very urgent way. Uh, and we will learn some things about the ways we can deliver care, even when we're not able to be together. But I think the most important thing that's come to me from this is a recognition that the healthcare marketplace uh, is not prepared to deal with a healthcare crisis. And you can see that because we, in the midst of a pandemic, are laying people off. We're closing hospitals and clinics. Uh, we're struggling to make sure that we're getting supplies where they need to go. The marketplace of healthcare, uh, which is about uh, the system that uh, is uh, a business, is not prepared yet to care for people in a crisis. And that's where we need to go in terms of health care. And nurses are going to lead the way. Uh, in the vision section of your campaign website, it encapsulates your vision as one that prioritizes equity in every area. And you mentioned this before, um, health care, public education, workers' rights and economic justice, criminal justice reform, the environment, and it goes on. You bring a breadth of experience that is not like the typical freshman senator. So with that perspective that you have, what do you hope to achieve? I want to join with Minnesotans and build a future for all of us, an inclusive future, an anti-racist future, an equitable future. And I believe it's possible. I, I came out of the race in 20, 2018 really transformed by a transcendent politics. It showed me that there is more possible when we come together. And the politics that is being practiced right now is about short-term power and transactions. And it won't deliver on the toughest issues that we face. And Minnesotans are eager for something different. They're ready to participate in something different. We just saw it in this election with record level turnout. Minnesotans coming together, Americans coming together saying we want something different for our future and we're gonna act on it. I think it's important to say right out loud that our democratic institutions are under attack in this country. And we need to restore people's faith in what we can accomplish together, not only with our politics, but through our government and a government that actually cares for people, that sets its sights on serving the people who make it up. Um, I wanna accomplish that. It is a, a big dream. It's maybe for some an idealistic dream, but I think it's necessary if we're gonna maintain our commitment to being a self-governing people in the United States of America. And finally, before we go, uh, I watched your interview with House Public Information from 2014 when you were majority leader. And in answering one question, you said that the hardest part of being a legislator is finding a path forward to make progress on the things that are most important to Minnesotans. So as you mentioned, and as we all know, these are divisive times, and the Republicans are currently in control of the Senate. Will you be able to find ways to be effective? Of course I will. Minnesotans are counting on me and they're counting on every person that they elected. We've grown too accustomed to saying at the end of elections, well, it's divided government, so gridlock will be the answer. Uh, and Minnesotans have grown cynical about that. And I understand why, because when we don't get the table that we want through the election, a lot of people say, well, now we can't do the thing we wanted to do. And we can't wait anymore to make sure we have world-class schools that are preparing our kids for the future. We can't wait anymore for a solution to climate change. We can't wait anymore to build green energy jobs, to make sure that all across the state of Minnesota, that we are taking on the next generation of what will build wealth for our communities. Those are the challenges that we face and Minnesotans elect people to go to work to find solutions, not to warm a seat, not to go to a debating parlor. Uh, no, we're going into the Capitol as the representatives of the people to do the work that they've asked us to do. That requires working across the aisle, of course. It requires compromise, but it also means not settling for something because it's bipartisan, but instead working to actually make progress for the people. That's what I'm gonna do. Senator-elect uh, Aaron Murphy, I wanna thank you for your time.
Thank you for having me. I'm really excited uh, for the next chapter and I look forward to working with you. Eric Putnam defeated Republican incumbent Jerry Ralph by about 300 votes in the recent contest to represent Senate District 14, which includes St. Cloud and portions of Benton, Sherburne, and Stearns counties. I spoke with Senator-elect Putnam this week, and I began by asking him what that narrow margin tells him about the district he will represent. Thanks again for, for having me here. I really appreciate it. Um, and that's a good question. You know, uh, we did win, we won by 316 votes, and that doesn't sound like a lot. Um, but in context, it's twice the number uh, of, of votes that were in the margin in 2016. Um, so there's, I think, a general assumption that, that St. Cloud is a place where close elections occur. But what I think is, is probably more true is that uh, the closeness of our margin is actually more a reflection of 2020 and the weirdness of campaigning and COVID than it is of St. Cloud in particular. Uh, if you look at the 3,000 votes that went to a third party candidate uh, behind a, an issue that I support, uh, if you look at the uh, number of uh, college students who weren't living at St. Cloud State and didn't vote there this year, uh, when you put in all those factors, uh, and, and include also that my opponent door knocked and I did not um, out of uh, respect for public health, um, I think in a normal year, uh, this would have been a pretty substantial margin because I believe that I reflect the values of my community and St. Cloud was ready for change. You ran for the House twice in 2016 and also in 2018, and those efforts uh, did not lead to election. This is the third time, perhaps the charm then for you, but now in the Senate, you've run for the Senate as opposed to the House. Why make the change? Well, I, th I think that, uh, first off, I'm in pretty good company because uh, my pals, uh, Melissa Hortman and Dan Wolgamont, both uh, had to run twice before they won their third time around. And I don't think that's all that uncommon because this is kind of a hard thing to do. And it takes uh, some effort and some time to kind of learn how to do it properly. Um, also in 2016, when I ran for the house, uh, I'd never been involved in electoral politics. I never knocked a door until I knocked one for myself, which is not something I'm especially proud of. And we didn't start running until almost July. Uh, so that was a very quick election. Um, and uh, in 2018, we decided to do it again. I was very proud of how we did. But I think if you ask any politician, the only answer for why did you run for office is I wanted to do the most good for the most people. Uh, and for me, that opportunity was in running for the Senate this time around. Now, you are a professor of communications at the College of St. Benedict, St. John's University up in Collegeville, and you have expertise in the history of public arguments about race, colonialism, and political culture. Does this area of study provide any insight into the divisiveness of our current political climate? Yeah, I think it's super important. And, and the, the way you phrase that makes me sound like a complete egghead and a dork, which is probably not completely inaccurate. But in the simplest sense, what I actually do is study um, uh, how language creates boundaries between people. Uh, I'm a rhetorician, so some people who study what I do will study you know, speeches by presidents, but that always bored me. I was always much more interested in this idea of how does language create, uh, create a, an us and a them, uh, this community or that community. Um, and that is really compelling to me. And I think that in our era of divisiveness, that understanding how flexible the boundaries can be between people and communities is really important. Um, and that's a big part of what I do. Um, but you know, in terms of my subspecialty, I, I do have an interest in justice and in making things better for people. And I think if you look with an unjaundiced eye at Minnesota and you see some of the discrepancies and opportunities that people have, there has to be a greater investment in questions of justice, not just for one population or for the other, but for everybody, because we are all suffering when we don't have opportunity. Do you think that rhetorical understanding that you have will aid in reaching across the aisle or working with others who disagree with you? I do, you know, and also in my background as an academic, I'm a, I'm a really curious person. I'm always gonna be listening to people as much as possible and not to gain advantage, but to understand their point of view and their perspective. And I think that's something that's lacking in politics a lot lately, is this idea that the boundaries between us can be flexible. You know, my um, great, great, great grandfather founded the Republican party a million years ago, but parties are just like other senses of community in that they're flexible and dynamic and they change over time and relative to circumstances. And that's what I, something I study as a rhetorician that I think is important in understanding how people get along as they legislate as well. 
Now, many like to think of academics in the ivory tower as those who, you know, just live in this lofty world and, and don't bother to deal with the daily ins and outs of life. And yet you are leaving at least part time to come down to the Capitol now and dig into the real down and dirty work of lawmaking. Why? What prompted that decision? Yeah, well, so um, I'm a scholar, but I'm primarily a teacher. I, I think of myself as a teacher. That's my vocation. And I think that teachers are, by their very nature, people who have to be optimistic, have to be hopeful. They have to, to think that by their hard work, they can make things better. Um, and uh, I also think that as a rhetorician, I'm someone who, uh, that my discipline, uh, there's a, a long history of people who have been scholars and activists at the same time and legislators. So um, Cicero is arguably one of the most important um, philosophers of language and politics ever. And he was a senator uh, in Rome. So uh, it's kind of sort of what we do uh, in some ways. Uh, and so to me, it's a logical extension of what I've done. And I do intend to stay uh, teaching for as long as I can while I'm a legislator too, because I think it's good to have a foot in each of those environments. Uh, to keep uh, the relationship between schools and the legislature as, as um, uh, uh, strong as possible. Uh, and I think my students will benefit from me being a legislator. And I think the legislature will benefit from me being a teacher. On your campaign website, you wrote that, quote, our elected officials are often obstacles to progress rather than true representatives of our values. Later or elsewhere, you referred to, quote, selfish politicians who make government worse by manipulating the system. What do you mean and how do you believe that you will be different? You know, I think if you ask anyone uh, in Minnesota or even around the whole country about politics, one of the first things they're gonna say is, ew. You know, I, it, too often I think nowadays we have this deep, deep cynicism about politics. But I say too often, but I completely understand it and think it's by and large fairly justified. When you see the mailers that come out, the advertisements that come out, these are things that are built to disfranchise people by making them disgusted by politics. Um, we have always run a different kind of campaign and I'm a different kind of dude. Um, uh, in our elections in the past, uh, uh, this time around, uh, before COVID, once a month, our entire campaign team took a day off and we volunteered in the community. Uh, we built a house for Habitat. We uh, wrapped presents for the Humane Society at, uh, at the mall. Uh, I'm gonna keep doing work like that because public service is service at its nature. Um, and I think that once we bring that back to being a political figure, put the service back in, in public service, we will have a chance to kind of chip away at some of that cynicism that's corrupting our uh, political environment right now. And, and ultimately, I think, um, you know, I said I don't really like speeches by presidents, but to me, the best blueprint for citizenship is George Washington's farewell address. And he says two things that are very important to me. And one is, um, you should not be just a function of your party. Partisanship is, is not useful. Um, and two, that being a legislator or a politician is not a career. Your fundamental job is to empower other people to want to do it and then get out of the way. Um, and I take those two concepts, this notion of service and politics as empowerment, very deeply. Uh, and that's part of why I'm doing it, and it's how I'm going to do it, too. Senator-elect Eric Putnam, I want to thank you for your time today. Thank you. In the recent sixth special session, Senator David Thomasoni was elevated to serve as president of the Senate with bipartisan support. This is the first time a president has been elected from the minority party. I'm told that uh, this job doesn't come with a wig and a robe, but I think if it did, I would definitely wear the wig because I might need one. Um, Members, these are extraordinary times, and but for these extraordinary times, we wouldn't be in a special session, and thus I would not have the privilege and honor to be elected president in this bipartisan manner. Um, I can assure you that I would prefer that COVID were not present rather than being president. But having said that, thank you for all the bipartisan support. I'm honored and I'm humbled. I was thinking of all the previous presidents, going back as far as Alan Speer, who was president here when I was in the House, Don Samuelson, Jim Metzen, 
Sandy Pappas, Michelle Fischbach, and Jeremy Miller. And I was wondering what I could take from them to help me out in doing this job. But then I thought, well, even though this is a bit of history, and it's a bit of history because it's the first time since the advent of partisan politics in the legislature that there's a president from a minority party. Now, it's a bit of history that isn't going to last too long and probably not be remembered. So instead of emulating the 40 former presidents, I decided I would just be myself. So hopefully this is the beginning of working across the aisle and coming up with bipartisan solutions as we have just gone through a tough election cycle and we need to bring people together rather than form battle lines. So once again, thanks and let's finish up the business of the Senate. Okay, that's, that's my first test. I'm not supposed to let you do that, but go ahead. If you want to clap more, that's okay. <laughs>
outside. How are the settings chosen? Well, that's a, a kind of a conversation between the artist and the governor. So they can uh, pick and choose what they want as their setting. And uh, for instance, with Plenty, you know, that typifies this was the center of, of government. This is where he worked. This is where all of his uh, achievements were made was in that capital. Uh, with uh, Governor Dayton, it's really acknowledging, you know, the importance of the state capital, but he was also the leading official that led the preservation, restoration, repair of the capital. So that's a part of his legacy. That's something that you want to be remembered. Not only did you serve here, but it's a place that you help preserve for future generations. One portrait is distinctly different from the others, and that's the one of Governor Rudy Perpich, because it includes his wife, Lola. What's the story behind that? Well, the tradition for any governor portrait is to have just the governor as the person in that portrait. Uh, what uh, Governor Perpich had served non-consecutive terms, so he did have his first official portrait on display here, but because he had served a second term, he wanted to have that first portrait and a new portrait on display in the Capitol. And the Capitol Area Architectural Planning Board said, well, you can only have one representation. And he wanted to have his painting uh, with his wife, Lola. And so that brought up this whole controversy about it should be just the governor. And so he was uh, asked not to have her in that painting. And so he had a campaign, basically put billboards on University Avenue, you know, saying that they're not letting me and my wife in the building. So, you know, it just became kind of a, a, a sticky issue for several years. And then after he passed away, the family and other supporters got money to do a portrait with Lola in that painting. So you'll see Lola and Rudy in the same painting today. Each one of these portraits has uh, a plaque next to it explaining the accomplishments of that governor's administration. Who writes those? That's uh, overseen by the Minnesota Historical Society. So we have, we contract with historians or other people to write those uh, biographical plaques and the information. Is the content ever controversial? That, that's the problem if you have portraits of living people or be, being portrayed. It's, sometimes it's hard to really tell their story because they're still living that story. So sometimes that can be a controversial issue. Um, with the older governors, you know, you have a little bit of, of time to really see what the permanence of that legislation they might have been supporting, the effect that has. So you have a, a better idea of the impact that that governor did have you know, 100 years ago. In a sense, these portraits uh, tell the history of the state uh, through time. What do visitors, do, do, they, do they comment ever about these portraits? There's a lot of people who will, you know, as they're walking through the building, are curious. They want to see who these people are. They, they know some, they recognize some from their lifetime. And so they're interested in reading about them and seeing them portrayed here. And, and people usually comment, it's nice to see these portraits here because it does reflect that history of Minnesota and the different people that has served as that executive officer. Join us again next week as we delve into more topics affecting Minnesotans. I'm Shannon Lurkey, and on behalf of all of us at Senate Media Services, thanks for watching.